I'm not sure if government right can be checked, can be well accepted. That's point one. Point two, I'm not sure whether I can get the money from Legico. Uh, whether the taxpayer is willing to pay for it. Yes. And well, I'm sure most of most mo most of us here are quite willing to pay a higher price in terms of bus fare, electricity bill, in return for better air quality. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of people who say no is not in this room. But the second more important point is, is that the only way to clean up our buses? Now, uh, expediting the replacement of old buses uh, with public support, with uh, subsidies from government, seems to be an easiest way out, right? And I'm sure a lot of us are willing to pay for it. But are there any other possible alternative? Whereby, you know, the government would not be required to you know, intervene into the operation of a essentially private company. Are there any options that we could uh, 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 look into? For example, um, we're in talk with the bus companies about the possibility of retrofitting the old buses, U2, U3 buses, with some kind of uh, devices, what they call the um, SCR, the Selective Catalytic reduction devices, which potentially could um, upgrade the old buses from U2, U3 standards to U4 or even U5 standards with a simple device. Now, uh, this kind of device is, in terms of its capital cost, is pretty cheap. It's about $150, $150,000, right? <laughs> it's pretty cheap compared with the cost of a new bus which is uh, around uh, 3 million Hong Kong dollars. Now we are in discussion with the bus companies about conducting a small scale trial to see whether we can adopt this kind of technology in Hong Kong. Uh, the discussion is going on and I, I hope the bus companies will be forthcoming. Uh, it is potentially a much more cost effective way of improving the environmental performance of our uh, bus fleet without the need to, you know, requiring the taxpayer to buy out the but entire... It's not the taxpayer. You've got reserves of I don't know how many billion well, dollars. Half, half a trillion. Half a taxpayer. trillion dollars. Well, uh, not going into this, but I want to say, yes, I also agree that maybe buying it out is not the best way, but just reducing individual vehicle. Uh, we have looked at a lot of plays that will not be the solution. Transport demand management, probably how do we make sure that the most polluted bus do not go into the place where most people uh, are there. Like in the urban area, in Europe, in a lot of countries, well, even in China, there are restrictions in terms of polluted vehicle going into the city. I think we need to look at not just per vehicle emission. We have to look at, well, how do we more uh, manage the demand in the city? Like whether uh, low emission zone, that type of thing can work in Hong Kong. And, and those are relatively easy and practiced uh, methods in other places. But since I have the mic, I definitely want to talk about this. <laughs> because, well, I, I certainly agree with Carson, particularly look at this line, which is the PM line going down. But what I want to highlight is that, well, is it down enough? Because in terms of the World Health uh, Organization standard, what we want is to get down to this line here, the first line here, we are at around 60, we need to get down to 20. So we are still a long way away. And as uh, Nick just talked about, well, we think that this actually so if the government do something, the improvement will show up. We just want that to be faster. And that increase in uh, management probably has to go beyond just per vehicle emission type of uh, vehicle. Uh, vehicular control. We probably has to go to something like uh, transport management. Okay, that's uh, the point on PM. The other can, can point. I, can, I, can I add one point? Uh, uh, following, following on your point on PM. Now, <laughs> Professor Lau just mentioned the fact that 
about, say, 60% of the PM's concentration in Hong Kong is from, uh, from the mainland. Now, the point is, even if the emission, the local emission of PM in Hong Kong is going to be reduced to zero, we're not going to meet the WHO's ultimate standard. Now, that's the fact of life. Even if Hong Kong does not produce any PM, we are not meeting the WHO standard. Yes, I, I would agree with that. But the level probably will be down to the second line here, uh, around 40. And that actually, well, so, so, sorry for throwing your chart. <laughs> uh, OK, but uh, another point on nitrogen, because how, uh, just now, uh, Carson actually talked about, well, our increase in NOx is related to the regional ozone increase. And that is true. Uh, our increase in NO2, uh, and then there is also a decreased trend, trend in uh, NOx. But the scale here actually is uh, a little bit different because the NOx uh, scale is actually about three times. So if you put it at the same scale, the NOx line is up here. <laughs> and the reason why we have this is uh, when the emission comes out, it comes out as NO. And uh, what we mean by NOx is actually uh, including both the NO as well as the transformed uh, NO2. But if you look at this from a more simple form, we can think about the nitrogen. Whether it's in NO or NO2, it's the nitrogen. And that nitrogen is really from the vehicles. And that nitrogen is the one that gives us the NO2 at the end. So I would still say that our local, uh, our vehicular issue is a big driver for our uh, roadside NO2 issue. But I, I certainly agree that the reason year that increase is related to the increase of ozone. But if we can substantially reduce our NOx at the roadside, then we can see that trend re reverse. And that also required probably our use more of more electric or hybrid vehicle or the reduction of uh, traffic in the city.